This is Gareth Southgate, and this is the Three Lions Podcast. Hello and welcome. It's the Three Lions Podcast. My name is Russell Osborne and this is an independent England football supporters podcast. Well, we waited nigh on five months and in the blink of an eye, the international window has passed. We now have to wait until early June for the next senior men's internationals. But it sure was a busy window and for many reasons. And no sooner had I put that preview episode out there, there were more squad changes. Uh, we knew that Sam Johnston had come in to replace Aaron Ramsdale, but he must have been at St George's Park less than 24 hours before he pulled out injured. I doubt he even got his boots dirty, or his gloves for that matter. Uh, so Southampton's Fraser Forster was drafted in, and he was last called up back in 2017. So it just goes to show you are never out of the frame. And then Arsenal's Bukayo Saka withdrew with COVID, which unfortunately has been on the rise in the country over the past few weeks. Now, this is going to be a bit of a busy episode, so please do stick with it. Um, But now it's not just the senior men who have been in action. There's been a whole host of age-related groups that have played. And I'm going to try and run through all the results and details later on in the episode. We'll squeeze them in. But as I tend to do, I'll be speaking with a couple of England bloggers about the games that have gone past very soon. But before we get to those, please let me just remind you that the podcast can also be found on various social media channels, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Just search Three Lions Podcast, give it a follow or a subscribe. Or if you know of someone who isn't aware of it, please go and just tell them. It's not going to change their life, but it might make their commute to work a little bit more bearable or ease their insomnia. As we already know, it's been an international window. You've probably seen the scores, but I can't let this episode pass without commenting on it. That national team in blue, that team that we recently played, a country with beautiful landscapes, wonderful food, a country that unfortunately as a few running track grounds. Couldn't believe it when I saw it. I'm sure you couldn't either. Yes, San Marino scored a goal. Okay, only a consolation. But it was the first time since September of last year. Uh, Also, Christian Eriksen scoring for Denmark against the Dutch. I think he'd only been on for a couple of minutes. And did I mention Italy? (laughs) Yes, The European champions knocked out of the World Cup qualifying by North Macedonia. And in what finer circumstances? Away from home, last minute winner, stuff of dreams, jumpers for goalposts. Mm. (laughs) Oh dear, that means that not only have Italy not qualified for the World Cup for the second successive time, but I saw this on Twitter, can't find who posted it, so I apologise, but their last World Cup match was a group stage loss to Uruguay back in Brazil 2014. We don't need to reminisce too much about that. But their last World Cup knockout victory was in the final in 2006. Amazing. (laughs) Can't help but just raise a wry smile. (laughs) And another one. Well done to Canada. They have qualified with an English manager, John Herdman. So well done to them. Uh, That'll be interesting if we are paired up with Canada in the World Cup. World Cup draw, of course, is on the 1st of April. There will be a Three Lions podcast episode all about the draw. I'll tell you more about that. And that'll be coming to your podcast provider very, very soon. Right, let's get on with this episode. Okay, first up for England was Switzerland on the Saturday. What a lovely sunny day that was. Ideal 
for a couple of pre-match beers. Almost unheard of in March in England. 5.30 kickoff on a Saturday. Lovely. Gives a bit of a time to have a wander around. No rushing from work uh, like you do on a midweek. Straight to Wembley. Can always be a bit of a rush. Although sometimes, I guess, 5.30 kickoff, it could be said that the atmosphere perhaps suffers. Well, that could be possibly down to the performance. Anyway, we'll uh, we'll get on to that in a moment. Uh, as it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the show, host of Channel England Football. You can find it over on YouTube. Hello to Gary Lambert, who was also at the game. Gary, hello, mate. Hey, Russell, mate. You all right? Thanks Very for having welcome. me on. No, you're more than welcome. Thank you for joining us. Yes, we, we met up at, uh, at the Switzerland game or, or in London on the day. Yeah, yeah, we did. It was it was great, really. Since I've started my channel, there's been a few people who are like on my Twitter and my channel. I've been talking to a lot, and I've never actually met anyone. And you messaged me about it before the game, didn't you? Saying, you know, there's this Ukraine rally going off and bits and bobs. So I thought, oh, we'll head down there, and yeah, and, and, and I'm glad you saw me first, actually, because I'm terrible at recognising people. <laughs> Uh, particularly because yours is a podcast, so I haven't really seen as much as you as probably you've seen of me. Um, yes. So yeah, yeah. It, it was it was quite surreal when you came up and said hello. But it was no, it was great to meet you, uh, and thank you for some of the content you you put towards my video for the day. Thank you very much. No, you're more than welcome. Well, we'll uh, we'll touch on the uh, on the videos as the conversation goes on. But the the game England Switzerland it was a friendly. Before we get onto the um, onto the team, there's one thing that that does my head in when the opposition play in white at Wembley. The amount of times I sat there as the game went on and I don't know, I may have, I may have shouted out at once or twice in what would appear to have been support of Switzerland. Cause I just, oh, I just does my head in when, when England play in away colors at home. Yeah. It, it, I, do we know the reason why it was like that? I, that Cause I, I remember it was like two minutes into the game and I, I said to my brother, I went with at the time, I said, Hang on a minute, where the blue team? You know, where in the blue kit? And yeah, it just doesn't make sense, does it? But yeah, it did. I think it took a couple of people around us a, a few minutes to realise who was who as well. Yeah. Particularly where we were sat, you know, up in the sky. Uh, sometimes, yeah, you need a minute to figure out who's who. Is particularly if England aren't in white at home. I can only assume it's. I mean, sometimes they say it's to to flog shirts, but um, having yeah. tried to get this blue shirt in the past. You can't get any for love nor money. They're all sold out. So I don't know if that that yeah. can't have been a reason. But yeah, well, there was there was none in the shop because I went in there before, and so yeah, it, it, a bit of funny reason to, to to advertise it during the game, then not sell it in the store beforehand. Who knows? Who knows? I'm sure someone at the FA will uh, will know why. But yeah, let's get on to the get on to the match. It was a starting lineup. I've already mentioned that the, there was a few changes in in the squad in the lead up to this game um there was a there was a change in the the starting 11 right before the game uh Jordan Pickford in goal that change was John Stones was injured in the the warm up so Ben White was drafted in there was Connor Cody and Mark Gouy making his debut uh in what would be a, a three at the back then midfield again or, or wing back, I guess, uh, making his debut. Carl Walker Peters, Jordan Henderson, Connor Gallagher Central, Luke Shaw as the other wing back, Phil Foden, Mason Mount, and Harry Kane was the starting lineup. A three at the back. I think we can, we've got to dismiss this now, haven't we? Has it run its yeah. course? Yeah, it, it, it just didn't work, does it? Uh, it? The thing is, you think, you know, it's going to make us more solid, but when I was watching the game, it sort of, it left us quite exposed down the flanks. And, if you think about Switzerland, particularly in the uh, in the first half, they were just passing it around in front of our back three anyway. So there wasn't, it didn't seem to do any cover in midfield neither. So it didn't work, did it, at all in the first half. We were just all over the place. Um, the back three didn't seem to know who was picking who up. And then it, it, I think it asked too much of the wing backs as well because you're asking them to, you know, push forward from an attacking sense, but then also do all the defending as well on the on the you know, and that's where there were so many gaps down the down the wings, uh, you know, of England's uh, defence, and it was just yeah, it was just a poor poor first half, and, and the formation was really the key to that. I think the only thing that I can maybe put in defence of it was had John Stones have been there initially, he would have been an experienced England player. Um, alongside Connor Cody, Mark Gouy, whereas uh, clearly... He's very um, inexperienced. Yeah, it? very yeah. inexperienced. Yeah. White, Cody and Gouy have never played before together, so there was always going to be 
not misunderstanding, but just not the usual understanding that you get as a group of players who've played before on a regular basis. Um, so that would be in my defence of it, I think. But but yeah, the, as you say, it was just something that opening twenty minutes we we suffered. We it, not that we didn't look interested, but it was they, Switzerland were the better team, weren't they? Yeah. It, it, it felt like a friendly, um, mm. and I was going to say it felt like we hadn't played since November, neither had Switzerland, so <laughs> that one goes out the window pretty quickly. But um, yeah, it, it felt like a friendly. It felt like the players, they didn't seem too bothered, but it was, yeah, it just wasn't clicking at all. And, and I think Ben White in particular was struggling, I think, within that first half, um, just really didn't look settled. Um, he seemed to look better, actually, at right back, um, which is unfortunate for him because he's got no chance of getting there, has he, in a, in a, in a usual squad. Yeah. But no, uh, Mark Mark Gray, actually, I think, did did quite well, seemed to, seemed to have you know quite a good game, even though we, we did struggle in that first half. Um, the other good thing about the first half as well is Pickford certainly cemented his place as, as England's number one. You know, I know there's a lot of there seems to be a lot of hate around for Pickford. I think mainly, obviously, it stems from from club football. But as you'll know, if anyone's watched my channel and anyone speaks to me, I'm I'm a big fan of Pickford in an England shirt. Is is never puts a foot wrong, does it? And no. and without him in that first half, would have been three 0 down. Yeah, pulled off some some great saves, and I, I mean, I think actually pulled off a save that that led to the goal. Really, I think there was a shot came in from it. It may have been Jacko yeah. palmed it. Well, Stung his hands, I guess, but I don't think yeah. he could. He couldn't keep hold of it, and and from that passage of play, ball went out wide, and and it was crossed in for was it Embolo, Embolo, or yeah, how do you pronounce it, his it, name? It, it, it was Embolo when he was he was Switzerland's best player by an absolute mile. I mean, he was bullying our back three. He's a a big, strong centre forward, isn't he? Really, really powerful. But he he did seem to go down easy when he wanted to. But it was uh, yeah, he's got. It, it was a threat all game for for Switzerland, but it was a good goal as well. I think it was Xhaka who put the ball in, and it was a it was a terrific cross, and and he, he met it really well. And he, in like all good strikers, he sent it back the opposite way it came, and it you know it had Pickford glued to the spot. But it was a, it was a good goal, and it was coming, but uh, Pickford certainly kept us in it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, straight after that, uh, I think it was was it Shakiri? Did Shakiri have an effort where it? a shot that was palmed onto the bar and, and I think there was another yeah, save yeah. that followed a corner. They Switzerland really put the pressure on and I think they could have had another one shortly after it, really, shouldn't they? Yeah, I mean, I mean that save onto the bar by Pickford was just unbelievable. He, he blasted it at him from not, not far out. And he, you know, he, again, he, I, I was sat there and I'm thinking, God, it was almost how many are they going to get? <laughs> we, didn't, yeah. we didn't seem to be able to get out of our half. And yeah, they were peppering the goal. There was a couple of long range shots. Um, I think they did they end up hitting the uh, the bar and the post like two or three times in the first, I think, was it in the first half? I know they hit the post uh, from a corner or across, didn't they? Yes. Uh, uh, so the, yeah, they were just peppering at Pickford and hitting our woodwork like it was, uh, yeah, like they wanted to break it. But um, yeah, we, we were lucky to, to really um, go in level at half time. Yeah, well, well, level we did, and it was it was Luke Shaw with memories of of Euro twenty twenty. Uh, was, was it the same end? Was it the same? It end was. As well? Yeah, was same it? end, same side. I think probably <laughs> in the uh, in the Euros, he was he was just a, a little bit more of an angle. Um, and I I know we were speaking actually about that goal just before uh, as we were yeah. out during the day. But yeah, it was visions of of the game against Italy that that brought us back into it and. Whether it was deserved, probably not so much. Um, but but one one all at half time it was. It, it, it was a great strike, wasn't it? And and I think it it, it topped off a, a good half actually for one one outfield play, and that was Gallagher. Um, it was you know he put the ball across. I know he probably didn't mean to pick out Shaw, but he was the player who looked like doing anything for England. It was it was being a real nuisance to Switzerland in that first half, and. Um, yeah, I think well, I think he will get an assist for it, won't he? Even though it, the intended pass wasn't for him, but yeah, sure, coming in at the back post. I think everyone, everyone around him was saying it felt like the Euros final again. But yeah, no, he's he's got a good habit of doing that. I think that's two in. Is it two in two now for for sure? It's a bit prolific, isn't it? Really? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I mean, just <laughs> just thinking about um, Conor Gallagher, I've I've got a little note just next to him. I've I've just put industrious. He was uh, yeah. he was getting around, um, and and I guess. With him and Mark Gui and Carl Walker-Peters as well, um, 
are they are they doing enough to maybe cement themselves going forward? They're, they're obviously going to be thinking World Cup. That's going to be in their in their vision. Could they make it? Could all of them make it? I think Carl Walker Peters and um, Gallagher may struggle, but basically not because of the talent, but because of the competition that was in their places. I think Mark Gway, particularly with Stones not getting so many games again now, and and obviously uh, Maguire is really out of form. Um, he, you, you never know there. You know the centre back places in another what is it seven months may really be up for you know up for a shot, particularly if our two what we would call our two starting centre backs don't pick up. Yeah. Um, so I think only only from a competition place. I think I think Kyle Walter Peters for me looks. I think he, he struggles a little bit at this level. Um, I don't think he had his best game. Gallagher there, well, I, I, he's a great player, but I just think look at the competition that's there in that in that area of the field where we, we want to go. And he's got a chance of being in the squad, maybe for the World Cup, but certainly not a, not a starter. He'd have to go a long way to to cement the starting place. Yeah, fair, fair. Second half, uh, something interesting I noticed with the second half, and it was something that um, was mentioned uh, at the beginning of the game that the the actual game was in support of the Alzheimer's Society and the the players didn't have their their names on the back of their shirts for the second half, which was, uh, when you look into the whole reasoning behind it, was was a nice touch. Um, and those those particular shirts have gone up for auction already. They're way out of my league. I've had a look at the, uh, the prices <laughs> that some of them are going for. What, what um, are they on for out of interest? What are they, uh, what are they what, up to? Well, I think... Uh, well, we're recording this on on Monday evening. I, some of them are are upper of three figures, like wow. six seven hundred pound, and I think there's a couple there uh, for four figures. Um, but fair play, obviously, all the money is yeah. going towards Good the cause. yeah the Alzheimer's Society. But but not having names on the back of the shirt really makes you sort of realise how much you take for granted if you can see if you're in a position to see the names on the uh, on the back of the shirts. But although I guess we're where you were sitting, it didn't make a uh, blind bit of difference. <laughs> no, no, but yeah, you're right though. It, it was it was a, a class touch, and I think there was um, over the tunnel at the beginning as well. There was a nice comment that really you know stuck in my mind where they said, you know, you're here to make lasting memories. Day out at Wembley, but unfortunately for some, you know, memories don't last forever, and um, you know, link link with that. And I thought that was you know a clever way of explaining it, and yeah not coming out with the the names on the shirt it's it's a great cause i donated actually just before uh, before the game but yeah it's it's a fantastic cause and long may the fa support it i think it's great you know 90,000 people there let's let's shout about things like that yeah i, I don't know how long the um uh, the auction runs for but uh, yeah i think if you go to if probably just google i think it's alzheimer's silent auction if you're interested in that the second half though we we got we got the winner but it was only really because of the the mass of substitutions, I think, that really changed our our direction and the players of uh, a little bit more experience came on. Yeah, I mean, Grealish and Rice in particular, you, you, you saw the, the quality change. We were keeping the ball better. They just seemed a lot more composed. Um, I thought they were really good when they came on. Tyreek Mitchell actually came on and played really well yes. as well. Um, I think he had, you know, another one we need to mention. I think he was brilliant. Um, and we did change the system from what I remember. We went to four at the back, didn't we, I believe. And, and I think that's where Ben White went out right and, it, you know, performed a lot better, in my opinion. But I think the changing system and, and what was essentially, you know, more of a first team uh, squad was on the pitch, wasn't it, in the in the second half? And it, it did change. Having said that, though, we weren't very attacking still. You know, I can't think of many chances. And, Without the penalty, I, I, you know there wasn't many other opportunities for us to nick the nick the win. But um, yeah, it, it, it was a better performance, but it was still quite quite a drab game. I think we were saying this before the before the for this podcast about the paper aeroplanes and uh, Mexican waves. You know, you know the game's a bit poor if you've got a uh, yeah, paper raining down on your head. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the uh, regular listeners to the show will know my thoughts on Mexican waves, and yeah, I've, I think I've said about paper aeroplanes before. Just one thing that I was wanted to to mention. It's something that I mentioned on the on the preview episode, and I, I mentioned it on Twitter as well. That there was it was supposed to be a 60th minute applause for for an England yes. supporter who passed away, Kevin Norman, and unfortunately, that this sort of this whole substitutions tied in at the same time. 
there was Mexican waves going round. There were, as you say, the paper aeroplanes. And it, it was such a shame because it felt that this applause and appreciation didn't get the right recognition that it, it should have. The, the fact that it was... It was announced pre-game. It was, it was in the program, um, and the ball went out on on the time of of this applause that was supposed to be in the substitutions. Kind of, I don't know, diluted it a little bit, which which was a bit of a shame. Yeah, I think I think if it's in the program and it's a friendly, I think there does probably need to be. I know it might sound up, but a little bit of communication with the manager there and the and the squad just to say, look, on the 60th minute, this is what you know, this is what's happening. But I think there was like four substitutions, weren't there? Like yeah. Sterling, Grealish, Mitchell, and Rice come on, and I did start. I started clapping on 60th minute, and then everyone around me started clapping. I thought, oh, brilliant! And I looked down, and obviously I realised. All the substitutions were coming on, so yeah, it, it did get lost, didn't it? Really, it, yeah, it, completely. Bit of a shame, but but the winning goal came up, Harry Kane, and it came via the penalty spot, and it, it, was, a bit, it was a bit soft, wasn't it? That penalty yeah. Decision. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I, I I didn't know at the time. I was like, I was so confused what was going off, and and I, I just saw Kane like lift his arm up. So I assumed obviously it was Fran Ball, but. Obviously, you don't you don't get to see it. And then when I got home and watched it later, I thought that's that's soft. That it is. was soft. Like, he must have been what two yards away from him. Yeah, really. And his back turned as yes. well. Really, wasn't it? Yeah. So it's like you can't get much more unlucky than that. Um, but I think their first goal was offside, though, wasn't it? I'm pretty sure there was in the build up to their play there was an offside, and I think they were saying there was argument that it was in a separate um, piece of play. But I'm sure there was a build up to their goal, which was offside. But I think end of the day, I think the victory flattered England. It was a, you know, we got the penalty. Kane steps up and does what Kane does, you know, Mr. Reliable on penalties, but 2-1 certainly flattered us. Um, I did feel a bit sorry for Switzerland at the end. Certainly deserved a draw out of it, at least. It, it's a good habit to have though, isn't it? Winning winning games when you play in that bad. And it, you know, I'm going to say that bad. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a good habit that we're in at the minute. Yeah, well, it's hopefully something that if it comes up in, in the World Cup, we're not playing particularly well. If we can grind a result out like that when perhaps the uh, we're backs against the wall, then something that we can look back on, maybe a game like this as experience too. Uh, but here's one thing, obviously with uh, Harry Kane scoring from the spot, takes him to 49 England goals, level with Bobby Charlton. That in 68 caps, how many penalties do you reckon Harry Kane oh, has scored? That's a question. You know what? I, d- I don't think it's going to be as many as what people think. I'm I'm going to say, oh, I'm going to I'm going to be way out. I'm going to say twelve. No, oh, you're not way out. You're not way no. out. You're two off. Oh, that's, that's not bad. Actually, scored fourteen from okay. the spot, Harry Kane. I've got a feeling he scored two. Didn't he score two penalties against San Marino? He may have done oh, in the yeah, in the yeah. last game, but uh, yeah, there you go. And I actually just just with the penalty, the VAR. It just took too long for the whole VAR thing to, to... That's another gripe of mine, but everyone knows about that. Yeah, so, I mean, what, what can we take away from that? Just the fact that we've we've learned how to, to take a victory away from, from playing not as well as we should do? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, let, let's not underestimate Switzerland. They are a very, very good team, so a victory against them any time is, is a good result. Um, yep. But, it, yeah, we, you know, winning when we're not playing well is a good habit. Um, certainly trying out would you say, uh, well, take a new defence, really. There was a lot of, you know, our, our initial starting back four or five, whatever, very inexperienced. So it's good game time for them. But I do look at England quite recently and, and the form isn't, it's not, it's not, not the best form really when you get, when you go back to the end of the World Cup qualifiers, neither, you know, it's just past few games seemed a little bit disjointed. So it's, we've got to start to look more like a team, I think, quickly. You know, we've only got the game tomorrow night and then it's straight into that, you know, unbelievable Nations League group. You know, if we play anything like that, um, we're gonna we're gonna be in trouble, I think. I, I don't I, I think Southgate will pull it around and the players will be better for a competitive match. But there's a lot lot of positives, but then for me there's quite a few negatives as well that we we do need to have a look at. Yeah, still a few things to iron out. Go on and tell us about the the YouTube channel, Channel England Football. Yeah, so it's a, a channel I set up about a year ago, and it's it's basically like a, a few people have said to me, "There's there's nothing out there on YouTube anyway." Because um, I used to, you know, watch a lot of YouTube. We all know the famous 
club YouTube channels, if you like. But I've realised that there was nothing out there for England. There was a couple that I found, but there was uploading quite sporadically. But not only that, there's hundreds of different club ones. So I thought there's certainly a gap in the market for someone else to come on on the England front. And I just thought, you know, I want to create some videos all, uh, solely to do with England. Uh, so somewhere, you know, for like-minded fans to for all of us to have a chat really and a debate about squads and games after and before what you know what you get in the main media is when there's an England break you get might get a little bit of England content that week and maybe a day after and then that's it for six months again and, and that was really I was finding that quite frustrating really so I thought you know I'll set up this channel and I can talk about England in you know, February when there's no games on because yeah, that's what I want to do. When yeah. England fans all know that when you, there's a lot of people for some reason who just international breaks, uh, they hate them. You know, they don't want them. They find them boring. Yeah. You know, I'm the exact opposite. I used to love waiting for an international break and it was just finding like-minded people really. Um, so, yeah. That, that's what I enjoy watching it. Plenty uploaded there. And yeah, here's, here's to, to plenty more. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, definitely. Definitely plan on the... Uh, Planning doing a few more. Oh, you'll always see me uh, retweeting them there, and it's a uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be part of the one of your recent ones. Yeah, yeah, it was my, it was my first vlog. I, I learned a lesson actually to film in landscape, not in portrait. But <laughs> anyway, it's my, it's my first vlog. Like, like I think I told you on the day, I have no idea what I'm doing with technology. Like my my YouTube channel is. You, if anyone who watches it, you'll see that you know the video is changing slightly all the time. The lighting. I'm literally learning as I go along. You know, I'm not technical this at all, but no, it was a it was a good day out, and it's great to you know interview you and uh, and ask you a few questions for the game. You actually nailed it as well, didn't you? You, you nailed the prediction. You did say two one, and you did say our defence is pretty suspect. So you you nailed it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I did. Yeah, but don't expect that too often. That I think that might <laughs> yeah. be a little bit of a fluke. That one. <laughs> don't get putting money on anything I say. <laughs> no, it was it was it was a, it was it was almost bang on. There was not a lot you yeah. said that weren't right. So yeah, good good shout that one. Cheers. Yeah, Gary, thank you very much for, for taking the time. And yeah, let's let's speak again. Yeah, thank you very much, Russell, and all the best. There we go. That's uh, Switzerland done. Let's move on to the next game. And welcome, as always, to Dom Smith from EnglandFootball.org. Hello, Dom. Hello, nice to be on again. Thank you. That's, you're always welcome. Uh, we're going to talk Ivory Coast and just look back over the, the two games gone. But first, I have a bit of a confession to make. <laughs> Ivory Coast, I was sat in row 10 in the lower tier behind the goal last night. The view was atrocious, really. <laughs> it, I, I was about knee level um, with the players. I've since watched the highlights of the game. Obviously, the the first half when England were attacking and scoring two at that end, I, I was able to witness quite well. But you may need to hold my hand with this chat, Dom. <laughs> you probably had a better view than I did. Yeah, I mean, my view wasn't particularly high off the ground. I mean, I, I always used to go into the family enclosure when I was really young. And I always used to think that was a... I didn't really mind that, you know, being up in the heavens. It's it's not a bad view, really. You can, you can properly look down on it, but... Certainly, I don't think my my view last night, even though it wasn't quite that, uh, wasn't maybe as bad as yours. I'll, I'll, I'll accept that. <laughs> but when you're sitting from a your journalistic point, you're you're along the side, aren't you? Well, yeah. There, there's two press boxes, so um, they're they're just above the tunnel slightly. There's kind of one one more tier or half tier above um, the tunnel, and then and then the press box starts. You've got one just left of the tunnel and one just right of it. So right. yeah. Okay, well, let's see how we go. Let's see what you saw and, and what I didn't see. But um, the the starting eleven last night, only Ben White retained his place in a in a change of formation. Gareth went with a a four two three one. I think it'd be safe to say. Nick Pope came in, as we say. Ben White retained his place. Harry Maguire came back in. Tyrone Mings, Turk Mitchell, uh, after coming on as a substitute against Switzerland, he started. James Ward Prowse in midfield alongside Declan Rice. Raheem Sterling was captain. Jude Bellingham was up there with him, as was Jack Grealish. And out in front was Ollie Watkins. It came as no surprise, really, that Gareth changed it all around for the second game, did it? Yeah, well, I mean, I think one of the things that Gareth kind of had to contend with this time is that, you you know, you can't really control the uncontrollables. And among them are all these dropouts. He already had players that he couldn't have called upon, like Ben Chilwell, who have kind of long-term injuries. 
at the point of naming the squad. Then after he named the squad, a number of players weren't even able to join up. Alexander Arnold went, Reese James went, um, Tammy Abraham went, which is a shame because it would have been nice to see whether he could rediscover his Roma form um, in an England shirt. And then once they were met up, I mean, I mean, Stones obviously injured himself in the warm up against Switzerland and, and went home before the Ivory Coast game. And I think Saka uh, got COVID, didn't yeah. he? And was sent home. So, in a way, you know, I actually spoke to Gareth Southgate about this, and and he and I said, has it been quite quite a nightmare this <laughs> this this month? And and he actually said, if anything, this has been a more normal month. And if he's okay. able to keep the positives, then good for him because. Yeah. Um, you know, he's not been able to learn necessarily as much about his players and try out quite as much as he'd have liked. But, you know, what he was able to see, he would be reasonably pleased about. I think both performances were were maybe slow at the start. Um, and then obviously Switzerland, after it stopped being slow, was absolutely nightmarish for 10 minutes or so. And Switzerland yeah. were just raining down on England's goal. But against the Ivory Coast, I mean, England were pretty much in control throughout. The red card didn't help them at all, really. Didn't help the game really, I don't think. And I think in general, I was I was a little bit disappointed with Ivory Coast. They didn't offer, even with eleven men, they didn't offer a great deal. Or, or the perhaps that's that's more in favour of England being able to shut them out. Well, I thought. I mean, I think it was forty minutes in the red card, and it's a stupid one at that. Although it wasn't a red card. It, what he was doing was stupid. Um, two yellow cards, and he gave the referee the ch- the chance, sort of the choice to, to give him them. But even so, there weren't really um, yellow card challenges, I wouldn't say. Um, but for the first 20 minutes, I thought Ivory Coast was a better team. They kind of starved England of the ball and, and England kept giving it away. And, and the Ivory Coast were, were playing around them quite well. And when England were getting frustrated and pressing them, you know, they they worked their way round England. I remember at one point, Raheem Sterling ra- really ran at one of the centre-backs and the centre-back just turned out and nutmegged him and carried on, which I thought was quite, <laughs> quite telling. But yeah. As the red card approached, England started to get into their rhythm. Bellingham had that chance, with that lovely one-two with Sterling. Um, Grealish was getting more involved, although I think overall he had quite a frustrating night, really. And then the red card basically killed any hope that Ivory Coast might be able to give England a, a proper challenge. And, and I thought it was really interesting when the referee gave that second yellow card to Serge Aurier, who, who Tottenham fans will know is, is fully a player who, who, who can get red cards here and there. Grealish and Rice were stood right by the referee, begging him not to send him off. Now, 10 years ago, England would have been seeing friendlies as, as an individual match in its own right. And, and what's, what's the best chance for us to win? Well, it's with the opponents down to 10 men. So let's hope they get a red card. Now, you know, the England mindset seems more mature and more professional. And it's almost this individual friendly doesn't matter as much. What matters is challenging it for trophies come tournaments. So let's give ourselves a proper challenge. And how do we get a proper challenge? Well, we, we do it with 11 v 11. Yeah. So Grealish and Rice were, were, were kind of begging the referee not to send him off. And I thought that was, that shows that how England are now a properly elite, you know, that's just one example of how England are a properly elite nation with an elite mentality of how can we improve ourselves and challenge ourselves rather than how can we win a pointless friendly against a team we've never played before. Yes, yeah, and no, I agree. Um, I mean, it's quite quite the sportsmanship as well. When when I watched the highlights back and and seeing Grealish's reaction, he was he was quite not disappointed that he was going off. Um, and I must admit, when I uh, where I was sitting, I didn't quite know what the sending off was for. And at one point, someone actually said Grealish is going as as he walked towards the. Um, the touchline, yeah. but no, it, it was the sending off for uh, for the Ivory Coast. But on the on the goals front, or or you mentioned Bellingham, he that a wonderful bit of interplay where he where he hit the post. It would have been great for it to go in, but we had to wait until Ollie Watkins scored his second England goal, which came courtesy of a Raheem Sterling cross, and then Raheem Sterling himself scored after having an initial shot saved. Grealish was the provider and and sort of provided for Sterling to almost sort of stroke it into the net, just uh, just beyond the six yard box. Um, so two 0 at half time, and from from my vantage point, I I thought it was a it was a deserved half time scoreline. Yeah, I think it was. Um, you know, if you looked at the first twenty minutes, it's, England didn't deserve a lead at all. But you know, halves of football are not twenty minutes long; they're forty five. And by the end, I think England were. Probably good value for for it. Oh, I, th- I think a two goal ad- advantage was about right. So yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Before we we get onto the 
well, I say before we get onto the second half, I guess there was only really the the Tyrone Mings header in injury time. But we we've got to touch on on Harry Maguire when obviously when he was selected in the squad, and I mentioned in the preview episode that what with Marcus Rashford being out of the squad due to poor poor Manchester United form, maybe Harry Maguire possibly could have been out under the same circumstances. But but no, he, he was brought in. And we know what Harry Maguire is is more than capable of in England colours. We know what he's done before. We know he can say uh, a rock at the back for England. We know that he can score. He's done so, what's it, six, seven times, I believe, for England. And to hear yesterday the boos when his name was announced in the starting 11, not only shocked me, but really disappointed me. And and I know full well that it disappointed Gareth Southgate because this is what he said to Sky Sports News shortly after the game. The one on Harry Maguire, it's obviously been a really tough time for him with his club, maybe a a lukewarm reception from a few England fans beforehand, but did he show his quality and and strength of character this evening? Uh, I, I thought the reception was a joke, absolute joke. Uh, what he's done for us, uh, the way he's performed for England has been phenomenal. I don't, I don't get it. So we we're either all in this together or we're not. And he's in an England shirt. And not only should you support a player in an England shirt regardless, but when he's played at the level he has and got us to the, uh, put the performances in for us he has, it should be total commitment behind him. So uh, I don't get that at all. Um, for his performance, p- pretty faultless really. Um, stepped out from the back really well for the first goal. Uh, was involved in the second as well. So, yeah, the, the team are totally united. We, we recognise everybody has difficult moments. Um, but he's a top player and he'll come through it. Dom, it's, it's not good that we should be having England players, doesn't matter who they are, if they're wearing the three Lions, we can't be booing England players. Yeah, I mean, it feels like a return to the dark days, this, doesn't it? Exactly what what's going to discourage a player from from turning out for England again. And, and Gareth Southgate said that in his, in his press conference. It, you know, his press conference throughout, whatever he was asked, was quite... Um, it was very articulate, but it was quite blunt last night. And I think the interviews he gave exclusively to the broadcasters after were also quite blunt. I think he's genuinely quite concerned about this. What you mentioned about, about Rashford, for example, I mean, Gareth Southgate is spot on about this when he says, you know, I've left him out because there are direct replacements who are in better form. That isn't necessarily true with Harry Maguire. And I wrote a very long piece before he'd even named his squad, well, well before he named his squad, um, you know, asking the question, should Harry Maguire be called up this month? And I, you know, did a, a long kind of deliberative piece where I thought about, well, um, is his form good enough? Obviously not. Has he been good enough for England over the years? Obviously, yes. And I concluded that actually the, the biggest point to consider is, is he going to be on the plane in Qatar? Well, obviously he is. He's, he's one of England's best centre-backs, if not the best. So is he going to come back in eventually? Yeah, he is. So what's the point leaving him out just to make a point? You know, that's counterproductive. Yes. Um, I think what people need to realise is that the England national team isn't only an, a reward for good club form. It's also a functioning football team that exists in, in reality and that, <laughs> that doesn't kind of exist in a vacuum. An England call-up is not a trophy. An England call-up is being selected to play for a team, but that means actually play for them. And when Harry Maguire has played for England, he's played very well. So ha- has his club form for Manchester United been bad this season? Absolutely. Has it been probably the worst at his club? Yes, it, it has. Um, but he he's there on what he's done previously for England. Now, in terms of the booing, Gareth Southgate called it, obviously, we heard there, he, co- um, he called it an absolute joke. Um, and and what the point that he's making, and he made this in the press conference afterwards, he said people with three caps and four caps are not going to be starting at centre back at a World Cup and and helping a team challenge to win because that's never happened in the history uh, of the game. That's what he said. He said teams that win or challenge for for trophies have experienced players, especially in defence. And he said we need a fit and firing Harry Maguire um, for that to be the case. Now 
you can't play poorly for your club for three, four, five seasons and expect to be playing international football. But he's been playing poorly for his club for probably eight months. And frankly, everyone at the club has been playing poorly. I mean, yeah. Cristiano Ronaldo has had his worst goal scoring record in his career. And he's probably the only person really who you'd say, maybe apart from Anthony Alanga, who's had a reasonably decent season compared to his teammates. Um, so Maguire is clearly suffering. He did all right um, the other night. But the bigger picture is that England is a unit and Harry Maguire is a big part of that unit. And club form is only part of it. The other part of it is how well you've performed for England and how well you can continue to perform. Booing your own players is only going to make them perform worse. So if you want Harry Maguire to perform worse and maybe make the team that you've paid your good money to to watch less likely to win a game that you've paid to watch, then sure. But if you actually break it down like that, it's it's understandable because they're, they're saying he shouldn't, why is he in the squad? But if you break it down into what it's likely to cause, it's completely and utterly counterproductive. It's a, it's a very strange mentality. The other one as well, the guy sitting behind me was constantly having a go at James Ward-Prowse. I mean, eventually it probably occurred to me that he was a Portsmouth fan. But leave our club allegiances at the gate. It's, yeah, we, we don't need to be going back to the time of, of booing England players. We're getting the right results on the pitch. We don't need to be disrespecting the players that are getting those results for us, for them, by booing them. Let's let's stop that. One player that we we certainly didn't boo and one player that deserves a lot of accolades that are coming his way and, and indeed the Man of the Match Award last night, Jude Bellingham. Well, we've we've known about Jude Bellingham in an England shirt for for some time now, and it's I'm I think Gareth Southgate now looking back at it has managed him perfectly within the England setup. He's introduced him sporadically, maybe sort of bringing him on as a substitute since his debut back in November of 2020. I think he won it against Ireland. Uh, he won his eleventh cap last night. And the, the hype around him, I think, now is is really starting to build. The people are really now understanding what Jude Bellingham is all about. And it's it's almost reminding me of a bit of, of Gaza being introduced back in the late 80s, sort of heading towards the, the Italia 90 World Cup. And form, injuries permitting, he's got to be, certainly he's going to be in the squad for the World Cup. But is he going to be a starter? Well, I mean, that's the question everyone's asking now. Can he dislodge someone like Phillips when he comes back from his injury or um, or Henderson to start alongside Declan Rice, who are, I make one of England's two kind of certain starters, yeah. Declan Rice, along with Harry Kane. Be- Bellingham is a really, really exciting player because he is consistent and so many young players are incredibly good, but not consistent. So he's got that. But even then he's consistent at 18, which is a very different age to 21, by the way, 18. It's, it's ridiculous to think he, he was playing uh, foot. He was playing match minutes at the Euros for England on their way to the final at 17. Um, I mean, he's starting every week for Dortmund but he's also their best player almost every week. Um, he's, he's been helped slightly in that regard by Haaland's injury. He's back from injury now. But he has been the best player for Dortmund almost every game they've played this season. Um, and that is that is remarkable consistency from a player of that age. I think a lot of people want to see, uh, you know, press and fans want to see Gareth Southgate play him in bigger matches, especially from the start, more often. I think hearing questions and um, to Gareth Southgate in the press conference last night and um, and him answering them, I think what's holding Gareth Southgate back from playing him more is not quite being sure that he he's got his position kind of sewn up perfectly yet. Right, he'd be a, he'd be an excellent number ten, but he's too good defensively for that. But he was saying yesterday, Southgate or or Tuesday rather, he was saying that. He's a, he's because he's such a young player, like Conor Gallagher, and he did and he did mention Conor Gallagher when he when he talked about this. He said they're so fast um, and 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 instinctive to press opponents that they maybe leave their automatic defensive positions a little bit open, sometimes a bit too early. Right. Um, where, where a player like Declan Rice, who's a little bit older, and and Henderson, who's older still, has that 
um, kind of uh, discipline, like tactical discipline, whereby they can press and they're very good at it, sh- you know, shuttling along to, to meet opponents and, and tussle with them, but not do it so often um, that if they get played round, then there's a big problem further back. Um, so I think tactically he wants Bellingham to kind of iron out those, um, kind of, that, that kind of tactical naivety. But goodness me, there's not very much of his tactical naivety. He's an excellent passer. He's he's a sensible passer as well. He wins the ball back without even thinking about it, and that's that's a huge thing for um, for a young player and and vital for an international team to have in midfield. Everyone needs players that win the ball back, especially in international football. And he's doing it consistently at that age. It's, it's very exciting. Um, will he start in Qatar? I, I'm not sure necessarily. Southgate will quite find the bravery to do that it would be quite a big decision i'm not saying he shouldn't that's not me saying he shouldn't that's just me predicting yeah um but he's certainly pushing and and jordan henderson who's obviously liverpool captain he's lifted the champions league and the the premier league over the last few years he should be worried because <laughs> uh, because bellingham is there and he's not going away well he's got six potentially six games what with the the nations league coming up in the summer to maybe really cement his place, maybe really put a uh, that thought into Gareth Southgate's mind. But uh, there was just, I, I saw a, an interview with him shortly after the game where they were just asking about his Man of the Match award. I'm not quite sure what the Man of the Match award is, like physically. It just looks like a, a piece of, I don't know, a block of plastic, to be honest. Um, yeah. But they were saying, oh, wh- where are you going to put it? Are you going to, take it back to Germany or you're going to leave it at home here. And, uh, and he was just so down to earth and he sort of said, I don't know, can I, can I take it on as hand luggage? Is it all right? <laughs> Which uh, you can see he's, he's still so young, but, but so great. It's a joy to watch. It's, it's going to be uh it's going to be a great journey watching him going forward. So with two games just gone, what, what can we take away from it just to round up? Uh, well, I, I wrote a piece on this, um, not for my site, um, but I wrote a piece on this, kind of <laughs> try, racking my brains about what England can really learn. And and I think the main learnings have been off the pitch matters, the right. booing and, and, yep. and what England need at, in terms of unity and and to be a core team rather than a group of individuals. And, and it, it kind of spoke volumes, the speed at which straight away after the game, the, his manager and his teammates were in person in interviews and, and, and on social media defending him, jump, jumping to his defence when when everything I've heard since suggests that Harry Maguire himself wasn't even too concerned about the booing, but it felt natural from everyone around him to to jump to his defence, which is a nice thing. So I think that's that's a piece of learning. Um, uh, the dropouts are a, are a piece of learning, it, but but Southgate already knows that you can't ever guess what tomorrow is going to bring in terms of your squad. You just have to kind of roll with it. I mean, you remember during the Euros when Mason Mount was starting to get into his groove in the group stage and then he and Ben Chilwell got COVID. COVID, yes. Apart from the squad. I mean, you, you can't you can't guess those things are going to happen. They, they, they just do. On the pitch, it, it doesn't feel like it's, there's a great deal England can learn. I mean, England tried 3-5-2 as a formation against Switzerland, which they haven't used since, ironically, a friendly against Switzerland at Leicester. Um, straight away after the um, 2018 World Cup, which is which is the formation they used there, and it just didn't work the other yeah. night. Um, it, you know, England was were far too open in, in in central midfield. Jordan Henderson was the only holding midfielder, and and, and Conor Gallagher and I think it was Mount were, were above were above him. And England were just too exposed. You, you can't use Henderson as your only holding midfielder. He needs to be in a two with a, with a Rice or a Phillips or a Bellingham. So I think that that formation is there to be to be ditched. I didn't quite understand why Southgate did that really. I mean, you know, I asked him about that actually. And he, and he said, well, we, we felt that that was going to get the best of the players we have here. Well, it kind of doesn't matter. Does it? What, what gets them, what gets the best of the players here? It's more sort of, if you've got two formations you use regularly and which work, which you do three, four, three and and four, two, three, one, then just persist with that. Yeah. Either whichever of those works best with the players you've got, go with that. I don't really understand that because he knew beforehand he wasn't going to use three five two at the World Cup, and he and he knows that again. It seemed kind of pointless to me. But the learnings this month are, I think, are, are slim pickings really. But you know, international football's about control, and and maybe that's not such a bad thing because it it shows that 
that England have kind of got through two games comfortably. And is that true? Well, just about it is. You know, the start of both games was was ropey, and and they'll look back at that, and and those players will know that. They're, of they're, course, they're elite elite players, but. At the end, England have beaten Switzerland, who are ranked 14th in the world and who are no mugs. They qualify for every tournament. And the Ivory Coast by, by three goals to nil. Um, and that and the first half, by the end, they were creating chance after chance. And and in the second half, I mean, the Ivory Coast didn't even see the ball, did they? No. So overall, you know, not a, a, a huge number of learnings, but but that which can be learned, it, it, I think, it is relatively positive. And and Southgate and Steve Holland can take forward and and learn from them and, and work with those learnings in future camps. Yeah, yeah, good to hear. Uh, and obviously, with with six games coming up, the Nations League, I'm sure there'll be uh, more opportunities to to put those learnings forward, as it were. Dom, as always, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. From what I've seen, you've been out and about at, at various Premier League games as well, writing. Uh, yeah, I've been. Yeah, I've started kind of covering the Premier League for uh, for the Morning Star, um, which has been good good experience to kind of get around to, to grounds more often and and, and get that um, kind of on the whistle match report experience. Yeah, I've been doing a bit of um, sub editing for the the Sunday Express as well on the sports desk. So that's been good. Um, but yeah, generally just just keeping busy and, and, and as always, lots more England content coming um, on englandfootball.org. I got an interview with a, a player who, who made the semi-finals of Italia 90 for England Ooh. in the next few weeks. So I won't say who it is, but but keep an eye out for that. Oh, look forward to uh, look forward to reading that. Dom, as always, thank you very much. And yeah, let, let's catch up soon if you're not too busy. No, it'd be great too. Thanks very much. My thanks go to Dom Smith there. Always a pleasure to have insight from him. Don't forget, you can find him on Twitter at Mr. Dom Smith and his site with all those match write-up player interviews that he mentioned. That's going to be an interesting one, that 1990 player. Uh, You can find it englandfootball.org and no doubt we will chat with him again very soon. And as promised, I was going to give you all the other results for England from this international window. I hope I've managed to collate them all for you. Obviously, we've covered the senior men. So let's start with the young Lions and work upwards to the under-21s. Now, firstly, I just want to apologise if some of my name pronunciations are not correct. But let's start the under-17s. This is where I ought to have the Vidi printer sound effects shouldn't i uh under 17s euro qualifier france three england one a uh, goal coming from arsenal's amario cosa dubery then the young lionesses were in under 17 euro qualifier and they played three games all over in poland to start with they lost 2-1 to france then beat poland by a goal to nil then saw off croatia 8-0 But despite that, they narrowly missed out on qualifying. So commiserations to them. Our men's under-18s, they were playing in a camp over in Marbella. Nice. Where they played Sweden. They won 3-2 there, thanks to goals from Isaac Mbaya of Liverpool, Oakley Kania of Liverpool, and Divin Mumba of West Ham. They then faced Denmark, where they drew 3 all. This after being 3-0 down. Goals from West Ham's Sonny Perkins and Manchester United's Dan Gore. And there was an own goal as well. Now, the under-19s, they played a couple of matches in the under-19 Euro qualifiers. First, they faced Ireland at Walsall and they won 3-1 there. Goals from Tottenham's Dane Scarlett and a brace from Aston Villa's Carney, Chuck Wamba. And next, there was another qualifier at home to Armenia. This one was played at Rotherham, 4-0 victory. Thanks to goals from Alfie Devine of Tottenham, Jarrell Kroash of Liverpool, Sam Adozi of Manchester City, and there was an own goal there thrown in for good measure. And then their third game was at home to Portugal, where two Dane Scarlet goals, one from the penalty spot, secured the win. And in doing so, they have qualified for the summer's Euro under 19s finals. So, huge congratulations to them. Just so you know, those finals, they are being played in Slovakia, 
between June the 18th and July the 1st. The under-20s, they were in action too. First, in what I believe was a friendly, away to Poland, they won 2-0. Then they carried on the good form where they beat Germany 3-1 in a game at Colchester. Goals from Sam Greenwood of Leeds, James McCatty from Manchester City and Terrace Dolan of Blackburn. And finally, the under-21s. They had a couple of games, both Euro qualifiers, firstly beating Andorra down at Bournemouth by four goals to one. Thorin Bulligan of Arsenal got a goal. Jacob Ramsey of Aston Villa. Morgan Gibbs-White, I think he's on loan at Sheffield United from Wolves. And Anthony Gordon of Everton. And then they were in action a couple of days later. Again, a Euro qualifier where they beat Albania 3-0. Again, Balogun got two. Well, I say he's at Arsenal. He's currently on loan at Middlesbrough, isn't he? And Liverpool's Curtis Jones got the other. There's plenty of names there that will no doubt become more familiar over the next few years, I'm sure. Uh, I hope I'll be able to pronounce them a little better as time goes on. But well done to all of those guys there and girls. Well, that's the results. Uh, one other thing I'd like to quickly cover, although quickly probably doesn't do it as much justice as it should but looking at the amount of episode podcast episodes i've got ready it's trying to find the right time to mention it the lionesses they are in action very soon two away games in their world cup qualifiers they face north macedonia on the 8th of april and northern ireland on the 12th of april as i say both of them are away manager serena weigman has announced her squad and said with it This is almost as close to her planned squad for the summer's Euros finals. So this will be interesting. It is as follows. She's picked three goalkeepers, Mary Earps of Manchester United, Hannah Hampton of Aston Villa and Ellie Roebuck of Manchester City. There's a lot of players picked from Manchester City, I have to say. Uh, Defenders, Millie Bright from Chelsea, Lucy Bronze, Man City, Jess Carter, Chelsea, Neve Charles of Chelsea... Rachel Daly of Houston Dash, Alex Greenwood and Demi Stokes, both of Manchester City, Leah Williamson and Lottie Wubamoy of Arsenal. In midfield, another one from Arsenal, Jordan Nobbs, Jill Scott, she's on loan at Aston Villa from Manchester City. Georgia Stanway, another one from City, as is Kira Walsh. Katie Zellum comes from the red half of Manchester, she's at Manchester United. And forwards, Beth England, Chelsea, Lauren Hemp, Manchester City, Beth Mead and Nikita Paris of Arsenal, Alicia Russo, Manchester United, as is Ella Toon, and Ellen White is from Manchester City. Let's hope that they don't suffer as much with withdrawals as the senior men did. And I think, although don't quote me, but I think they should be on ITV, those games, or one of the ITV channels. And hopefully we'll be able to get some sort of reaction to the results from those games later on in April. And that, I think, is as much as we're going to squeeze into this episode. Thank you very much, as always, for listening. It's a pleasure to have you along with me. If you're new to the show, I hope you've enjoyed it. If you're a regular... As always, thank you very much. Without you, this wouldn't be worth doing. I'll be back with you very soon. As I say, the World Cup draw is on the 1st of April. England are, of course, in it. I am hoping to get some fan reaction to the draw. I've been invited up to Wembley via the Supporters Club. Very kind of them to invite me up there to watch the draw, hopefully, with an ex-England player who I'm hoping to get a few words from. But that episode will come, hopefully, very soon. I hope you can join me for that one. As always, I think I've mentioned, the show can be found on all the social media channels, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Just search Free Lions Podcast. Give it a like, give it a follow, all that sort of jazz. But until the next time, thank you very much for listening. Take care of yourself. I'll see you soon. Cheers. <laughs>